Hello. Dear all, my name is Luke Renz. I am Managing Director of UPAVE and I wish you all a very warm welcome to our UPAVE workshop on pervious concrete pavements, an overview of European experiences. It's a, quite a challenge. Uh, we can say we're not yet after the COVID pandemic. It is still going on. However, we are allowed here to organize this event in Hotel Le Châtelain in Brussels, with where we expect something like in total some uh, 15 participants in person. That's nice. But also, and that is challenging, in the same time, we have about 100 people who registered for the online version through Teams webinar of this workshop. A bit challenge challenging, yes. However, we can count on a nice, uh, very up-to-date sound and vision installation from our Dutch colleagues from the C Cement and Concrete Center, from the Betonhuis, the Concrete House, from the Netherlands. So already thank you for that. We rely on you. Now, some seven years ago, within UPAVE, uh, we decided to review our organization, also a bit our functioning. And one of those changes was the creation of uh, some working groups. One of them was the working group in best practices. And we also started to organize these uh, workshops on uh, best practices. We also uh, rewrote our mission, where you can see that on the one hand, uh, we have a mission of advocacy, of uh, defending our sector, of being represented at the European institutions. Think of the European Commission, European Parliament. And also to, through our members, to engage with national and local decision makers. But on the other hand, we have the task to uh, share and spread our know-how about concrete pavements, concrete safety barriers, all kind of applications. and also to share, uh, to communicate on the benefits, to promote innovation, and also, as you can see, the best practices of all those uh, applications. This is already our uh, next workshop, I believe. So you can see we started in 2015. We talked about evenness, afterwards about joints in concrete pavements, the concrete mix. Uh, Two years ago, about hydraulically bound base layers and roller compacted concrete pavements. And last year, we already had uh, this kind of hybrid event here in the same place on concrete pavement preservation. So you see, we're quite active. In addition, in 2018, we had a workshop on concrete safety barriers. And in 2017, 19, and 2021, we had uh, even additional workshops in Belgium at the uh, Exposition, the Trade Fair on Construction Equipment, Mat Expo. So the last one was on the 9th of uh, September, so all less uh, than six weeks uh, ago. Uh, another working group that we created uh, more recently was the one on environmental strategy. Uh, and you can see here, uh, wh what did we do with this working group? Well, we discussed about a lot of... Uh, uh, environmental aspects. We created a, a nice infographic that you can find on our website and also a number of fact sheets. Uh, fact sheets on the first one on albedo, fuel consumption, recycling, and the last one on climate resilience. Uh, in which you can read about the increased frequency of floodings. Uh, indeed, uh, so uh, more flooding, but also more drought, droughts, is uh, one of the cons or the consequences of uh, climate change. And one of the things we also talk about are the mitigation effects. Uh, you see an extract here with a nice photo of a parking lot in a pervious concrete pavement. So indeed, uh, so pervious concrete pavements can uh, mitigate the problems uh, to some extent, at least, of the flooding, but can also help in mitigating the problems of drought. Let's say it's the availability of water 
become, which becomes less uh, predictable in the future and where those pervious pavements can help. Well, the pervious pavements are not something totally new. Uh, there are some experiences from the past. I refer to some experiences in Germany, uh, mainly on uh, motorways, the Autobahnen, and also uh, you see already a first one in 1994, also on a local road, let's say in the, in the Hockenheim ring, the Formula One circuit in, in Hockenheim, there was a test. And also here in Belgium, where I am personally active, we had some experiences and, and one interesting one was in 1996, the one in Herne, with uh, test sections of low noise concrete, where a top layer of porous concrete was placed upon a a continuously reinforced concrete uh, base, but uh, we'll see that uh, the first speaker will come back upon this uh, project. Uh, but the main objective of uh, this type of layers was uh, the noise abatement. Uh, so we know that uh, porous surfaces help in absorbing the rolling noise, but also uh, Solutions for water drainage have been looked for since a long time and there, of course, we also need those uh, pervious and, and porous uh, pavements, which can uh, allow to the water to infiltrate, which can help to store the water in a road a pavement structure and uh, which allow the infiltration of this water into the soil. And if that is not possible, well, it can be a delayed and retarded evacuation uh, to a sewerage system or a, uh, a, a drainage basin some further on. Uh, in Belgium, I know we were uh, already for some 20 years very active in the development of precast concrete elements uh, as solutions uh, for, for permeable pavements, which you can see here a few of, of nice examples. Now, there are a, a lot of uh, modern solutions available. Some of them are very nice, very efficient. So we do have that experience. However, for today, let's say the focus is more, uh, let's, let's say the focus is not on the noise abatement. It is on the pervious concrete for drainage, uh, draining purposes. Uh, either by porous concrete mixes, either by, let's say, a concrete slabs with holes in it, drainage holes, which can be a kind of perforation or an alveolar structure. We'll see this later in the presentations after the coffee break. And we focus also today not on the precast solutions, but on the in situ cast uh, concrete. So mainly compacted by Internal means for roller compactors or a vibrating plate. This is what is being applied for the pore, the gap graded mixtures. Or for some of the solutions, we use conventional, the typical concrete mixes, which are then also yeah, conventionally compacted by internal vibration. So you see, we have uh, different solutions. Uh, There are, of course, some uh, questions that already arise. Uh, I'm already thinking of if we implement those uh, pavements, so for which traffic will it be? A question that always comes back is what about the evolution over time, the clogging? Isn't that a problem? Are there ways to maintain it, maintenance? What about the appearance? How does it look like, especially in urban environments? Often people want uh, a very nice surface finishing, a surface aspect. So those are a, core, a few questions uh, to which we hope we'll hopefully will find some answers in the program of today. A program consisting of a total of uh, five presentations, uh, three before and two after the coffee break. We have just a, let's say, a very small change in the program. Program We had uh, provided our Q&A at the end of the workshop, but we'll, 
if there's time, we can maybe handle one or two questions after the presentation, but we can, we will definitely already uh, handle the questions for the first three presentations before the coffee break. And so the last ones only after the coffee break. I can already announce also the, let's say the, the most challenging point of, of this afternoon is because we have the first uh, four speakers are here live in person present and will give the presentation as I do right now. However, our fifth speaker, uh, Mrs. Alalea Kia, she will give a remote presentation from at home. So then we will have to switch the equipment here, but we hope that that will work also. So this brings us to the first presentation of the day for which I will uh, give the floor to uh, Dr. Ilya Bonen, researcher, technical advisor and deputy head of division at the Belgian Road Research Cent Center. He's dealing with a project, the Bee Drain project, uh, which should help us to get yeah, the right specifications. One of the difficult questions is also what is the relationship between what we achieve in the laboratory, what kind of compaction, and what is happening on the work site. Uh, those are some yeah, difficult aspects in, in this uh, research project, which uh, Elia will highlight us. Thank you. Thank you very much for a nice uh, introduction, uh, Luke, and uh, good afternoon to all of you uh, in the room today and also the people behind their screens in the virtual audience uh, today. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, you, Pave, uh, for the invitation to share our experience on uh, pervious concrete pavements uh, with the Belgian uh, bee drain uh, pro uh, project, as Luc mentioned. And I will also briefly sketch uh, the Belgian uh, context and history uh, in this uh, matter. Uh, but first, as an introduction, uh, the general uh, context, I think it's clear uh, for everybody that we are all well aware that uh, with the effects of uh, climate change, we are increasingly getting touched by major flooding events in recent years. Uh, also this uh, summer uh, in Belgium, as you can see in this uh, picture. So we urgently need to take uh, action by creating less hard surfaces and uh, creating infiltration of rainwater into the soil. And so one uh, possible uh, means or possible solution is uh, pervious or porous uh, concrete as uh, one type of uh, sustainable urban drainage system, uh, which is characterized as a concrete, uh, so which a discontinuous grading uh, curve with no or limited use of a sand uh, fraction. Uh, so giving rise uh, to avoid content between 15 or uh, 25% which uh, gives us uh, high water permeability ranging from uh, 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus two meters uh, per second in combination with sufficient compressive strength uh, ranging from 10 to 25 megapascal as function of the application we look for. Now, uh, as Luke already mentioned, uh, pervious concrete is not a new research uh, topic. And uh, first studies in Belgium indeed uh, focused on the uh, application of an uh, open uh, porous concrete layer as a noise reducing uh, top layer for road uh, pavements uh, with the first experience already in 1996 in uh, Belgium where uh, several uh, test sections were uh, put uh, in place with uh, low noise pavements uh, at the N255 in uh, Herne where uh, a two-lift uh, CRCP was uh, put in place with uh, different top layers and one of which was an open porous uh, concrete with a maximum grain size of uh, seven millimeters and also with use of uh, polymers in the mix uh, to increase uh, strength and also the freeze-thaw durability as you can see here 
uh, mentioned on the on the slide. Now, a lot of testing uh, was done uh, on these uh, different uh, test tracks regarding noise reduction uh, also uh, over the, uh, the years that uh, came. And uh, indeed, uh, these results on these uh, test sections revealed that uh, the very porous concrete gave uh, the best initial results for noise reduction uh, based on the large noise absorption in the voids uh, of the open uh, concrete. But uh, actually, uh, this top layer lost this noise reducing function quite uh, fast after uh, construction uh, due to clogging uh, of the voids, but also uh, losing of aggregates at the surface, uh, sort of raveling that we also see for uh, porous asphalt uh, pavements. So uh, in the end, uh, after uh, uh, only 14 years, this uh, top layer was covered with an asphalt uh, pavement uh, and the solution was abandoned uh, so far because of this durability uh, issue with this uh, porous uh, concrete. Uh, in addition to the application uh, as a top layer, um, porous lean concrete is already known uh, and applied quite some time as a, a base layer, uh, mainly under uh, pavings and especially under water permeable pavings in Belgium, where we have a lot of experience uh, in time and uh, also uh, partially some specifications already exist uh, for this pervious lean concrete in our standard uh, tender specifications for road construction in Belgium uh, where for instance you also have some reference uh, concrete mix described in these specifications as you can see uh, on the left. And uh, in the next slide uh, you can see the current uh, specifications for the pervious uh, lean concrete uh, in Belgium. So with a, a limit uh, for the compressive strength determined uh, after 90 days on a course taken from the pavement uh, on site with an individual value that has to be above uh, 10 megapascals and average value of more than 13 megapascals. Uh, also, the water permeability is tested on cores of 100 square centimeters of uh, sur surface area and a height of uh, 10 centimeters, where we also have an uh, individual limit value that has to be above uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 4 meters uh, per second, so tested in the lab. And finally, in uh, Wallonia, there's also a kind of uh, measure of the effective porosity on the same types, of course, we measure the water permeability. So this is actually a kind of um, a measure of the uh, water accessible pores uh, of the pervious lean concrete measured by a sort of hydrostatic weighing uh, underwater on the course we take uh, from the pavement, as you can see on the right uh, bottom picture. And so hence, there exists also uh, a standardized setup uh, to test the water, water permeability of these course um, taken from the site, as you can see uh, here, uh, where we can use uh, either a constant or variable water pressure in this uh, flow through test, where the water flows from uh, below to above. Uh, but uh, at our center, the BRC, we mainly use a constant head uh, per meter. So we um, keep the delta Z, the water pressure constant, at about one to two centimeters to mimic uh, the real life behavior with rain uh, falling on these uh, pavements or these uh, base layers that can uh, collect this water. Now moving to uh, the current situation, the current uh, context in uh, Belgium, we actually uh, see an increased or let's say renewed uh, interest and uh, demand for water uh, permeable pavements, uh, among which the cast in place porous uh, concrete is one uh, alternative. However, uh, there are no existing guidelines for uh, the concrete composition, the performance requirements, nor the application for the uh, application as a top layer in Belgium. Uh, so that's a lack of uh, guidelines we have there in Belgium for the moment. And on the other hand, for the uh, application uh, of porous lean concrete uh, as a base layer, there is actually also a demand uh, from the sector itself for a more uh, representative, realistic uh, compaction method in the lab uh, to mimic what's really happening uh, in uh, real life. As you can see in the picture below, uh, we want a method in the lab that represents the compaction we do in real life, 
but uh, the current method, which is a modified proctor test, is not uh, comparable to what we can or want uh, achieve on the uh, construction site. So that's also an issue we need to resolve in Belgium, as Luc also explained already. And also in uh, other European countries, a lot of research and uh, experience is ongoing, for which we see some examples today, I believe. Uh, here you can see, for instance, some examples uh, coming from the 2018 conference in uh, Berlin with uh, many other European countries or even in Brazil. Some examples uh, are visual for uh, pervious concrete uh, pavement research. And so also in uh, Belgium, uh, we followed uh, this uh, example with some more recent uh, testing. Uh, first of all, on the pervious uh, lean concrete uh, materials uh, with uh, some new pilot sections that were constructed uh, together with the company AC Materials uh, in Purs, in the neighborhood of Antwerp, uh, where we constructed uh, some test sections in the summer of 2018, where uh, two different mixtures and also two types of compaction in the field were used and then combined also with different methods of uh, compaction uh, to make laboratory samples, as you can see here in these uh, pictures. And for instance, one of the lessons uh, learned uh, from these uh, field tri uh, trials with uh, AC materials was, for instance, uh, that one type of uh, compaction method, which we call the, the vibro compression, it's a standardized method for uh, hydraulically bind uh, materials, is actually not really a good compaction method because we get uh, quite unhomogeneous samples, as you can see in the middle picture. So uh, this uh, method was actually abandoned based on these uh, first trials with uh, AC materials. And other thing uh, we could uh, find out is that our uh, setup, our double ring in uh, filtrometer that we normally use uh, for pavings, could be also used uh, to test the in situ uh, permeability under certain uh, conditions for these pervious lean concrete uh, materials on site also. Next, uh, moving uh, more to uh, recent uh, days, uh, also some new test tracks uh, were put in place together with uh, the company Holsem, so Holsem uh, Belgium in this case, uh, at our premises in uh, Stedebeek, uh, nearby Brussels actually, uh, where a pervious road concrete mix was uh, put in place and where we also gained uh, quite a lot of experience uh, with several lab testing methods, uh, among which also one most promising technique that I will discuss later on in, uh, in more uh, detail. So, and based uh, on these uh, recent uh, experiences and also uh, the knowledge we have uh, from the past formed the basis uh, for this uh, new uh, pre-normative research uh, called uh, bead rain which started almost one year uh, ago and uh, the title comes from the french beton maigre de nom pour revêtement routier durable so from the french word and actually we tried to tackle uh, these two problems uh, we stated before on the one hand uh, we have the lack of uh, general guidelines uh, for concrete competition and also for performance requirements for the application as purpose concrete uh, as the road surface, the top layer. And secondly, we also have uh, a lack or absence of a good test of compaction method uh, for pervious lean concrete in the lab to really represent what's happening in reality in the framework of a certification of these kinds of uh, mixes in, uh, in Belgium. So uh, in this context, we initiated this uh, Belgian bead rain uh, project uh, with the financial support uh, also of the, the Belgian uh, government, actually, and also together with our uh, research uh, partner, uh, Crick OCCN, which is actually the research center for the Belgian uh, cement uh, industry. And so this project has two uh, main goals, actually. Uh, one, uh, to be able to uh, recommend some technical uh, guidelines or improved uh, guidelines, also uh, new performance requirements and also uh, adapted testing methods uh, for the application of these kinds of pervious uh, concrete mixes. Uh, first of all, as a function of the application, uh, we can apply as a top layer or as a base layer. 
also as a function of the uh, in situ compaction methods where di different alternatives exist. And finally, also some more uh, functional requirements. If we're looking at the application as a, a top layer, also uh, things like uh, driving comfort, riding comfort, uh, the free stall resistance with the icing salts or the raveling issue uh, is an important aspect to study for these uh, pervious concrete mixes. And then in the next step, hopefully we can draw some uh, recommendations uh, for the Belgian standard tender specifications and possible normalization uh, in the future with this uh, bead rain uh, project. Um, here you can see the, the research uh, plan of this uh, project, uh, where a first phase consisted actually of a literature review and also selection of materials and concrete mixes we want to study in a lab phase, which is the second phase we are mainly occupied with for the moment. Uh, but next to this lab phase, we also try to, let's say, correlate or validate the lab results also with results obtained on real construction sites, which is the third uh, phase. And there's uh, more or less a feedback loop in between uh, to be able to validate lab results with uh, field results. Uh, as you can see, we're almost uh, one year underway now and with one more uh, year to go. So I'll present some first results uh, of this uh, Belgian uh, pre-normative uh, research. Uh, first of all, regarding literature review, indeed, uh, some guidelines are readily available in uh, other countries, uh, such as uh, France, uh, the US, and also Germany, as you can see here, uh, some great guidelines for the application as base layer, as well as uh, pervious concrete uh, top layer, you can uh, see here, with a lot of useful information. Uh, Next, regarding selection of uh, materials, uh, you can see here, we make use of uh, limestone aggregates in different uh, size fractions uh, in combination with a, a blast furnace slag cement, which is mainly used in Belgium for road uh, construction. And also some uh, polymeric admixtures uh, we try to incorporate for the mixes used for the uh, top layers. So we have one concrete uh, mix, which is the, the Compo 1, which is mainly intended for application as a surface uh, layer. But in addition, we also add test one uh, Compo, the Compo 2, uh, for application as a purpose uh, concrete base layer. And finally, we also try to incorporate commercial mixtures we observe from the construction sites we uh, follow in this uh, project. So uh, currently we are mainly uh, occupied with the testing um, in the lab. Eh? So where the main challenge remains uh, to have or design this representative compaction method uh, in the lab, which mimics uh, very realistically what we want to achieve uh, in the field or which represents the things we uh, apply in the field, as you can see uh, on these pictures uh, on the right. And then Subsequently, we can also uh, look at influence of different uh, parameters in the lab, for instance, vary varying the cement uh, content of the mixes, looking at varying water to cement ratio, the use of admixtures, as mentioned, uh, and also maybe we're going to look at uh, incorporation of color pigments in pervious uh, concrete mixes. And then in a second phase, uh, we also study or try to look at the more uh, functional properties for application as a uh, top layer, looking for instance uh, at the reveling uh, issue where we can use techniques from the asphalt uh, pavements uh, or also looking at the skid resistance of these kinds of uh, pavements with, for instance, a pendulum tester that can be used uh, on site. Now, uh, looking at some first results uh, of this uh, lab testing, Actually, uh, the most promising compaction method uh, so far uh, is what we call uh, uh, Proctor Light, Proctor Allégé en français. Uh, so it's a sort of a modified, modified Proctor test uh, where we compact in uh, two layers with the um, uh, small uh, drop weight and also the lower uh, drop height where we use uh, 56 blows per layer. Uh, and also what we noticed in this lab study, that it's really necessary uh, to make or to drill cores out of the initial proctor sample 
because uh, otherwise uh, we can't get reliable results for the water permeability test, uh, the device I discussed before. If we use the initial proctor samples, we actually get false results for the water permeability because a lot of percolation goes uh, via the sides of this proctor sample. So that's why we always need to core uh, inside this initial proctor sample to make correct measurements. That's one thing uh, we saw. And then another thing uh, we can look at um, in the lab is indeed uh, influence of the compaction energy we apply in the lab uh, on the results, where we could actually uh, play around a bit uh, with these normalized uh, parameters for the proctor test, as you can see here, uh, where we can play with the, the mass of the rammer or the drop height of the rammer in the proctor uh, test, and combining this with the equation you see uh, below to uh, calculate the specific energy we use in different uh, lab compaction methods. And so indeed, uh, our partner, Crick, played around a bit with these uh, parameters and indeed effectively saw uh, that by changing the compaction energy, you can uh, change the fresh density of the pervious concrete, as you can see on the graph uh, above, and in this way also impact uh, on the porosity of your pervious uh, concrete mix. And so based on these uh, preliminary testing uh, in the lab, we found out that this Proctor Light uh, was the most promising compaction technique uh, in the lab, which also gave uh, comparable results to uh, test plates we made uh, in the lab with a vibratory uh, compacting plate. Next, what we also uh, did is we looked at the influence of uh, the water content uh, of the mix uh, on the achieved uh, compressive strength in relation to the water permeability. Uh, for instance, you can see uh, a clear effect on the uh, compressive strength. You have to ignore the blue uh, bar, but for the rest you can see that there is sort of optimum in the compressive strength, whereas the water permeability in this figure uh, is decreasing with an increasing water uh, content. So in the end, uh, we could find sort of a compromise between uh, both with this uh, first mix. With 100 liters of water, we get a good compromise between mechanical strength and probability. Uh, so with an average compressive strength above 20 megapascal, an average uh, probability above four times, to, uh, four times 10 to the minus four meter per second. Just to give one example. Finally, we also looked at uh, other things uh, in the lab, uh, for instance, uh, some fresh concrete properties, such as the workability uh, of these kinds of pervious uh, concrete mixtures, for which we use uh, uh, different techniques coming from rich uh, concrete, such as the, the WALS or VBA compaction methods or uh, testing methods to test the workability. Uh, but these need to be adapted for these kinds of uh, pervious uh, concrete mixes to have good reliable results. Uh, for instance, using some kind of weights on the surface area to make good contact between uh, the test plate and the pervious uh, concrete. And a second thing, we also look at the workability in time or the period for workability uh, of this mixture by using uh, this uh, kind of uh, standard you see below where the workability period is determined uh, by determining after different times after mixing what fresh density we can get. And so the time at which the fresh density drops below a certain value, 2% uh, drop, uh, determines the workability period of this kind of mix. So these two things are also really very important uh, parameters that we need to uh, take into account for the practical application on site for these uh, pervious concrete mixes. But as I mentioned, besides the lab testing, uh, we also try to uh, validate or correlate these lab results with results obtained uh, on the field, for which you can see one example here of a construction site in uh, Herzele in Flanders, where a pervious lean concrete was put in place and where the, actually the contractor himself tried different uh, compaction methods and also with two kinds of uh, concrete mix with a different uh, cement content and where we also were present during the construction site to take samples uh, of the fresh concrete uh, to uh, apply different kinds of compaction methods for making lab samples where we try afterwards also 
to compare uh, these results with results on cores actually taken from the pavement itself, as you can see here. Now, for this specific example, we get to say that there's quite some variation on these results uh, for cores, as you can see through the large error bars. But nonetheless, based on the average results, where we could see some impact uh, through the method of compaction and also the cement content on the results we observed, for instance, for compressive strength, which are the blue bars in this case. And moreover, we saw that the water uh, permeability was sufficient and high enough with an order of magnitude around 10 to the minus 2 meter per second. So one uh, hundred order of magnitude higher than the limit value we oppose uh, for the moment. So that was quite OK and also comparable with the results on proctor samples in the lab. And finally, uh, now we are starting at the phase of looking at more uh, functional properties. Uh, for instance, the freeze thaw resistance with the icing salt, for which we need to develop an adapted testing method. And because we can't apply a layer of salt solution as for rich concrete, we need to change the method. And for instance, also look at the impact of polymers uh, on this freeze thaw durability of pervious uh, concrete mixes. So to conclude, uh, we can say uh, that pervious lean or not uh, concrete uh, remains a promising solution for uh, sustainable water management in urban areas and that more experience and improved uh, technical guidelines are underway in uh, Belgium with this uh, Belgian bead drain project where we try to go from base layer to surface course uh, applications and the current focus is on the functional properties uh, as a pervious concrete uh, pavement uh, layer. And I'd like to end with this uh, picture was a very recent uh, construction site we followed in Borgerhout near Antwerp, where uh, this system was applied for uh, a basket field uh, terrain to show the viability of these kinds of applications of pervious concrete. So with this, i like to end my story. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer some questions now or later on as a function of the time we have. Thank you, Elia, for this uh, uh, <coughs> interesting presentation. Uh, we did receive a question, but it's a more general one from Peter, who asked, how can you pay support on lobbying for pervious concrete solutions how can pervious concrete be recognized as a solution that preserves the drainability of the soil instead of just being seen as concrete and therefore automatically dismissed when it comes to sustainable solutions with for instance plastic long grids would be considered acceptable but pollute the soil by their micro fragments not really a question but i think we can uh, affirm uh, <coughs> that indeed we do defend this as a uh, sustainable solution. It's different. You don't have to build a pavement when it's not necessary. Then the best option, the most sustainable option is to, to, to leave the soil as it is when it's a, a good draining soil. However, when you need a pavement, then you come to competing solutions. And I think then, uh, as we have seen, these uh, cement contents or rather low we can use uh, low carbon cement so we will do all the efforts uh, obviously to make it uh, the best competing solution in terms of uh, all environmental aspects and okay i don't want to go into detail about the other solutic, uh, solutions like the, the plastic grids but i think no i'm pretty convinced that with our draining concrete we do have a uh, good solutions but, maybe other speakers can <laughs> give a part of the answer as well later on uh i don't know was there any other question no okay okay thank you uh elia Uh, then we go on with our, our second uh, presentation. Some four or five years ago, 
I was in Paris for a uh, French seminar uh, on the same topic, all kind of draining uh, solutions, and I was very impressed about uh, the state of the art in France already at that moment. So I thought it was really absolutely necessary to have a view on those French uh, experiences today, because I think in Europe, yeah, probably France is the country with the uh, most uh, examples of uh, projects and, and work sites in this type of concrete. And in addition, they, have, uh, the, they are uh, very, very nice. So uh, I would like to invite to the floor Mr. Eugen Florescu, who was a road projects manager uh, at uh, Holsim. He works for uh, Holsim, the, the, the global division uh, of Holsim. And he will... Uh, show us the applications on construction sites in France. Thank you, Luke. Good day to everybody. And I would like to start by saying how happy I'm, I am to be here today. I really hope that the bad times are uh, starting to be behind us and uh, we can uh, see already the, the light a little bit, the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I think it's important to be face to face. I think uh, it's uh, comfortable to do presentations and to ha take presentation on the comfort of, the, of its dining room. But as a road construction engineer, I know for sure that we can build roads from the comfort of a dining room of a, or, or a home office. We need to be on site and uh, as a material provider, I know also that it's impossible to deliver the product or the solution to the dining room of your client. So I, I really want to congratulate Luke for organizing this uh, seminar in life uh, and online in, uh, in the same time. Starting my presentation, uh, um, well, I, I, I need to congratulate Elia for the quality of its, his presentation uh, before. Uh, with a lot of studies and laboratory results. Mine uh, is more based on the experience that we have uh, working with uh, different clients and different partners on uh, um, site application in, uh, in France. But first of all, because I had already the question before the, the meeting, what about my company? You know that um, a few years ago, uh, two giants on the cement and concrete industry decided to merge. Uh, it was uh, Holcim and, and Lafarge. Uh, this process started in, uh, back in uh, 2013, and the company was named uh, Lafarge Holcim for a while. Well, starting with uh, July this year, the, the company took the name of Holcim. So uh, everybody uh, in the house is working now under this, uh, this brand. We have, as you know very well, a global footprint. We are present uh, in more or less um, 80 countries around, uh, around the globe. Well, the, the figures are changing on the, all the time because we also uh, sell some parts of the business or we uh, make some bolt acquisition in, in uh, this uh, uh, field of, of construction. And, uh, but this gives you already an idea about uh, the, the global uh, extension of, of the company. I'm not, okay. Um, in, um, in terms of um, uh, sustainability, we have uh, in front of us a plan that will lead us to uh, 2030. Uh, and, um, uh, over uh, the, the, um, the quality of the material, the quality of the concrete and the uh, ingeniosity of our solutions, we need to consider things that are very important for all of us and for the industry as well. The climate, the need of improving the circular economy, uh, the respect for the water and nature and the, the people and the community. There are mega trends um, um, driving the, the market, and it's not only about our market, but about all the, 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 the current society. And I will insist just a moment about the, the, the global population growth. I don't know if you know how many people are right now on Earth. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, it's 
7.6 billion, more or less. And I was taking a, a look into the statistics. And when I was born, I will not give you the year anyway, but it was something like uh, 3.6 billion at the time. How many people will be on Earth on 2060? It will be more than 10 billion. So more or less in 100 years, the population of the Earth tripled. Will, will triple, in fact, up to the 30 years, 35 years uh, in front of us. So this means really a huge challenge for uh, all the fields and obviously for the, for the construction uh, and material supplier uh, business. Otherwise, we, I would say that uh, the business uh, where I'm coming from is following a little bit the general trends valid for all the industries in terms of demand for better standards uh, in living or uh, digitalization. Uh, and of course, one last word on this slide about the uh, sustainable solutions. Back from my experience, when I started the, the, the school, the university, uh, all the studies for uh, um, concrete construction, bridges or houses uh, were done for 50 years ahead. And it was really uh, something, uh, you know, something uh, huge 50 years ahead. Well, now uh, more and more often we are facing projects where the requirements goes to 100 years in terms of tunnels or bridges. Uh, or, or even, or even um, um, buildings for for people or offices. So the 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 demand in terms of sustainable solution increased. I don't know uh, how many times in in the last uh, thirty years. Um, why why flooding? Uh, because flooding is really a huge problem uh, for the for the. Um, uh, humanity and uh, preparing uh, uh, this presentation uh, I was somehow surprised to see this figure in fact flooding is the most uh, current uh, natural disaster that occurs on, on the in the in the earth and it's also the the disaster affecting more people um, it's strange because just when I woke up this morning to take the train to come to Brussels, I received an invitation from uh, uh, Philippines. They organize uh, a summit on uh, flooding management in November. And they, they are very, very interested in finding the right solution because these countries in, uh, in uh, Southeastern Asia, they are really confronted with this uh, phenomenon. And you know, there, there was uh, examples given in your presentation from, from Belgium that suffered a lot uh, recently because uh, of flooding. Germany also this summer, and I'll not mention all the terrible events that uh, um, um, uh, stroke uh, different parts of the world during the time. But flooding, it's really uh, something that needs to be addressed uh, separately, and this is what we are, uh, this is what we are doing. Why uh, this? I, I will not give you all the, the class on this, but it's just the fact that because of the huge urbanization in the last year, the quantity of water that comes to soil is less and less important, passing from, um, I don't know, 50% to only 15% in the case of, of uh, big cities. So. As road construct, uh, construct, constructors and uh, road engineers, we need to find the best solution because in a big city, a lot of surfaces, up to 30%, according to some studies, are covered by roads, by parking. And this limits the possibility of water to be infiltrated in soil, but it's also an opportunity for us to find solutions and to contribute to a better management of, uh, of the water. And this is how we arrived to what we called uh, hydromedia. Uh, in fact, I was looking uh, once again to earlier presentation. I would say 
I was saying to myself, what on earth I will say new? Because uh, after all, in terms of product itself, as a mix of aggregates and cement, hydromedia or all the B-drain or other solution that you studies are quite similar. The, but the important fact is to find the right applications and uh, to improve the characteristics of these materials in order to enlarge the possibility of, uh, of use. We say that it's an engineered material because we try to uh, work with the, um, the composition of the, of the, of the concrete uh, in terms of uh, granulosity, in terms of Dmax, in terms of uh, uh, cement type and also cement content. And we say that hydromedia can be used either as a, as a system, and we worked on this uh, with uh, several partners, and I'll come back uh, to this further on in my presentation, or as a construction uh, solution for architectural applications or as a material for road surface or, or uh, road base. What, I, what we say and uh, we think we are right is that we re reproduce by using hydromedia or other porous materials, other porous materials, we reproduce the cycle of water. Part of it will be infiltrating uh, on, on the soil, part of it, it will be kept on the, on the structure and will be um, uh, evaporated during the time at a certain pace, limiting somehow the, the um, uh, heating effect in, uh, in, in cities. So, in fact, uh, hydromedia is an uh, evolving material. If we uh, take like this, uh, the, on, on this slide, the, the in, uh, clockwise, uh, we started to uh, imagine and to use uh, hydromedia as a, for water drainage, either in surface or base for different types of, uh, of roads or parking. Initially, it was a parking. Um, after that, we said maybe we can use the same type of concrete in order to, to drain the water, to capture the water and to, to uh, um, manage somehow the, 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 the water ratio in uh, constructions, roads, or uh, rooftops. After that, we, 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 uh, we said maybe you can, like I mentioned, make, maybe we can use this uh, material in order to store it for a limited time uh, inside the material, and after that, to evaporate it on the cities in order to, to limit the heat uh, island effect that occurs uh, in, uh, in big cities. And we uh, didn't stop in our technical center in Lyon. Our colleagues from there, they continue to, to, to work looking into the future um, for different other use, uh, uses of, uh, of this material like in uh, biodiversity concrete for ocean applications or uh, uh, fighting uh, air pollution uh, uh, in order to clean the, the air in, uh, in cities or in roads. Um, we are, um, but and, and there my, the comparison with the previous presentation is uh, less impressive on my side because uh, we just give you just a, a few figures on what we can achieve with, the, with these materials. Um, the French regulation for the material, uh, it's only, um, for instance, in the compressive strength, only 10 MPa, uh, which is definitely not, uh, not a figure uh, for uh, high traffic roads. Um, but uh, you'll see later on that uh, with some type of hydromedia we can achieve uh, even 15 uh, MPa, uh, and in terms of porosity, uh, the, the minimum limit is 15. Um, well, uh, you know that um, you gave uh, um, Eliab values for concrete. I know that for asphalt, for instance, the draining systems of asphalt goes up to 2022 
um, percentage of uh, voids in the in the mix. Uh, and I, I, I think, I personally think that uh, we still can do uh, better than, uh, than this. So, uh, what are the applications um, that um, are already proven for, uh, for, for hydromedia? We have uh, application for uh, uh, pedestrian, uh, we have applications for uh, very light traffic condition, uh, and we have already uh, the experience to say that uh, placing this type of material is not extremely challenging. You can, uh, with the time and with a little bit of experience, easily uh, manufacture, transport and place this, uh, this type of material. Obviously, it's, it's a little bit more complicated that, uh, than a normal concrete, but there is not uh, something um, uh, science fiction and can be placed and uh, um, um, transported and manufactured quite uh, quite easy using this more or less the same type of equipment that you are using for uh, other type of uh, of uh, rigid uh, pavements. Uh, you can also find um, usage on. Uh, um, base layers uh, for uh, architectural applications or under traffic, but uh, once again for uh, light uh, traffic. And uh, for instance, in this case, you can place uh, on, um, on uh, concrete uh, bricks uh, to be used as, uh, as um, roads for uh, light, uh, light traffic. And f just just uh, uh, a few examples of uh, sites already uh, executed on, uh, on on in France, uh, mainly uh, one example uh, of uh, of a parking uh, in uh, Albini. It's uh, uh, near uh, Annecy in the south, uh, well central west part of. Uh, uh, of France, you can see the the, the aspect of this uh, of this site, which looked quite quite nice. Uh, um, and uh, after that, uh, we did some uh, uh, berges, some uh, river banks uh, in uh, in Orleans. Uh, another site which was more important uh, with a different color, mineral color. Uh, this is one particularity for this type of material; it can be colored quite quite easy. Uh, this is uh, on the city center of Lyon by the railway station. This is a site that it's uh, still ongoing uh, right now. You'll be surprised or maybe not to know that most of the sites are uh, in Lyon because we have the technical center in Lyon and we have a very, very good cooperation with the local authorities over there. It's, uh, it's another uh, uh, example uh, uh, in this uh, uh, park where we, uh, we use the hydromedia. And like I mentioned, we also uh, partner with a specialized company, and this is a, a partnership that we launched with a, um, um, a company speciali specialized in, uh, in rooftops in order to use um, um, hydromedia as a solution to uh, answer the, the needs and the challenges uh, presented by this kind of, uh, of construction. Um, so, and we, we have already executed uh, some, uh, some work, started uh, two years uh, uh, ago. Uh, sport fields, uh, also uh, you showed a basketball field. Um, different uh, other um, uh, places where we have already implemented uh, uh, this. And it seems to work very well, but it's obviously not a big market. And um, uh, Luke also mentioned the, in the introduction of the meeting, uh, we, we think that this type of concrete remains a niche product and it will stay a niche product for, for uh, uh, some time. But I prepared you a, a surprise uh, just before. Uh, so if we want to, to, to summarize somehow 
the, the advantages of hydromedia. Uh, obviously, we started by searching a solution to reduce the impact of urbanization, and I think it's, it's very important to, to, uh, to enlighten this uh, uh, once more in, and address all the problems uh, that uh, uh, you can find in, in the cities. Uh, well, for the constructors or engineers, it's important to have a, a high rate in terms of BREAM, for instance, which is the, the British um, uh, standard for this um, um, quality. So um, this can also improve the, the, um, these uh, rates. But, and like I said, we, it, it's not over. We are still working in hydromedia in developing other uh, applications. And I will say a word about uh, a solution which is not hydromedia, but it's another rigid solution for roads that we uh, not discovered, but uh, engineered in the last years. We call it the innovative road coating, which is also uh, a solution for uh, a rigid solution for roads for wearing courses of roads. In fact, it's a three centimeters concrete. Uh, placed on a normal concrete uh, with a very good drainability. It's, I, I would not say it's a, a, a porous concrete because we achieve only 20, uh, sorry, 12 percent of, uh, of voids on it, but uh, we manage to achieve resistance up to 25, 30 MPa. So this uh, allows uh, it to become a material for wearing courses. So, uh, and we are working, still working on it, placed on, wet, uh, on the wet on wet, on a wet uh, uh, base, this can be a perfect uh, wearing course. And I'll, I'll just uh, take one more minute on, on this slide, because we spoke about traffic and how uh, this type of materials are uh, behaving uh, under traffic. These are, are some pictures taken uh, from the, uh, the tests that we perform on uh, NANT, on the, the um, um, road laboratory uh, accredited in France. And we took these pictures on, on the joint uh, in this type of uh, materials, which was tested after, you can see, one million and five million cycles. And there is no uh, problem on this type of material after five million cycles. Just to let you know that the best in class asphalt that I saw there uh, tested with high percentage of modified bitumen uh, went out of, of service after 800,000 uh, cycles. So. It's, it's really a huge improvement for this material, if you like, we can keep in, in touch and uh, we really perform a full test of lab tests and trials and, and, and so on, and we have all, all these results. And we also perform a small section in placing this type of materials uh, with a, a modified slip form, but uh, unfortunately it is not really under uh, traffic. It's not on a, a real site, so I'll, I can't tell you, I can't, I can't guarantee you and proving you that it performs uh, like we expect. Uh, but anyway, the material was tested and now we are actively working with uh, some of the countries on, in, uh, in the group. I mentioned here UK, uh, Poland, in order to find a real life uh, application, a real site where uh, we can place with, uh, with a partner this type of, of material that might uh, um, really change uh, a little bit uh, the perception that uh, uh, people have on, on, on rigid solutions. And I'll, um, I will, uh, okay, this is uh, exactly what I was telling you about the countries. I know that we will not take questions right now. I don't know if you, if you want to, I can answer the, the answers uh, at the end. And I have my colleagues in Lyon uh, attending this also uh, that uh, might answer the question. I just want to say one word. Once again, I'm, 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 I don't take advantage of my 
uh, long experience in, in, in roads construction, it's not a good thing because I'm old and this is uh, how I, I, um, I accumulated all the experience. I think uh, desperate times like we are living right now uh, requires appropriate measure and radical measures. And uh, I, I really think that the road industry and the road construction and engineers need to think differently and we need to uh, find different solutions from everything that it was done before. I don't know if it's uh, thin concrete, the good solution. I don't know if it's hydromedia, the, the right answer. I don't know if it's the, uh, the modified asphalt, the right solution, but I strongly doubt. Uh, but anyway, we need to think differently and we need to come with, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, big ideas and uh, uh, courage, courageous ideas in order to change a little bit the, the, the shape of how roads are constructing uh, are constructed uh, nowadays. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, there were no specific questions for you yet. Maybe they will come later on. There was one general question, but we'll deal with that uh, for. Elia will deal with that after the next uh, presentation. But at least, uh, thank you, I have learned that indeed there are uh, all of the solutions are somehow similar as you said, but it's just the, the question is to find the, the, the right solution, the right application at the right just place. Because we've seen especially the differences of performances in terms of concrete strength, permeability, porosity, somehow different, so, but we know that it's not, not really different for the, the, the conventional concrete pavements either, so we are used to that. So, let's go now to the Netherlands uh, with our colleague Jeroen de Vriese was technical ad advisor, also in charge of uh, cement statistics at the Betonhuis, a concrete house in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, maybe we don't have the huge volumes of pervious pavements like we have them uh, in, in France or in Germany, for instance. But we're talking about, yeah, uh, the right solution at the right place. Well, if you want something particular, something special, something innovative, then you have to be in the Netherlands. And uh, Jeroen will tell us about some of those special applications. Uh, as mentioned, thank you uh, very much, Luc. Uh, thank you all. Um, it's good to see uh, in the presentations of, uh, of our last uh, presenters that we have a great similarity um, in the products, in the way we look at the pervious uh, concrete. Um, as mentioned, I will show you something about uh, the special applications. We call it special in the Netherlands because we started several years ago with it. And, and it isn't that well data driven. Uh, it's not as, as well uh, 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 researched as Elia <laughs> showed us uh, in our uh, previous uh, uh, presentation. But we have some, some uh, applications, try them. Uh, and maybe they are very interesting for other countries as well. Um, we started uh, with uh, a perfect concrete as a, as a roadside pavement. Um, it all started with some damage and incidents due to the soft, uh, softened verges in the Netherlands. We have uh, lots of uh, local and, and uh, smaller uh, agricultural roads, lots of rain. Um, and when the roadsides aren't properly uh, uh, kept and water will uh, uh, soften the verge and when a, a truck or a car uh, slips into it it won't come out and often they get stuck or when it's worse uh, accidents happen with people being hurt so we had to look at that well quite quick there was some kind of solution um, reinforcing the verges with concrete um, well that that is a solution but there are some possible downsides and the downsides are due to the optical 
widening of the road. When you widen the road, optical, people go faster. It's a natural thing. Uh, it's what we saw, and especially on the smaller roads, as we see in this, uh, in this photograph, uh, when the speed goes up and there's a small road coming from the right side, uh, an accident will be very severe. So we were looking at a solution where we um, uh, reinforced our road sides, but also keep the road optical as small as it was before. Um, the first test we, we did uh, around 2005, I think, um, this photo was taken in 2007. Um, we started just by uh, exchanging the materials, the normal concrete we used for the reinforcement with an open kind of concrete, the pervious concrete, uh, applied by um, a slip form paper. That was what we knew, so that was what we used. And we got some really good results. Uh, we also tried it in the worst case, so um, it was rainy. Um, the roadside wasn't saw cut, so it wasn't straight. And there was water uh, in the foundation where the reinforcement was placed. So normally that is one of the bad situations you can, can find. Um, but the application went well. And as you can see, um, the interaction between the concrete and the asphalt si uh, roadside is quite well. Um, here we used some uh, uh, natural round materials. Um, and this was the result. As you can see, the left side is a bit straighter. The right side is more or less of is less straight. Let's tell it that way. Um, the left side was placed with a, a, a slip form paper. The other one with a, a machine we see a little later. Um, so we tested what uh, would be the results with the different kinds of machines we had. Um, well, that <laughs> we missed one photo, but okay. Um, those tests were going good. This was, uh, uh, for instance, a, a road um, that uh, had some heavy truck loads. It uh, uh, had some sun trucks running. So we asked the drivers to uh, to move to the side and uh, uh, expose the weight of the trucks to the concrete reinforcement on the, on the road sides, and it held up quite well. Uh, but of course, uh, when you want to do something in, in traffic, uh, you have uh, limited time. Um, you want <coughs> large quantities uh, and minimal uh, uh, driver um, of a limited closure of the roads. So after uh, there are some companies right now that have some asphalt spreaders. Um, they converted it um, and they use it right now and they achieve approximately five kilometers a day with good quality. So in this way you can prepare two and a half kilometers on both sides every day. But as, as mentioned, um, what we were looking for was a kind of, of optical, of uh, 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 reducing the optical widening of the road. So this picture was taken in 2012, where we placed a reinforced um, roadside just a few centimeters below the uh, top layer uh, on the asphalt road, and we covered it with uh, with soil, and uh, grass grows on it. Um, this way, the road doesn't seem widened, but it is. Um, and the sides have some, uh, uh, can, can carry the weight of a car. Um, as mentioned, this is placed in 2012. This picture was taken then. Um, this was uh, the same road last week. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can see, uh, grass is still growing over it. Because of the pervious concrete underneath, the water will uh, drain, so you have no water on the sides. Um, in the meantime, there is a roundabout uh, also in concrete, of course. Um, but here you can see that over all those years, it, hel it, it keeps up quite well and works quite well. Um, more or less the uh, same kind of solution is something we, uh, uh, we did a few years ago. 
Uh, we had the safe part of the asphalt edge construction. It was uh, a questionnaire from uh, Rijkswaterstaat, and, uh, um, where they saw, um, like we uh, saw before, um, possible accidents, um, trucks uh, with, with problems. Um, but this was not just due to the softening of the, of the edges, but to the different of height because it's an opal and porous open uh, asphalt, the asphalt top layer is higher than the soil uh, besides it. And um, when you go off the road and come back, we see this effect. And with this effect, the problem is that the correction from the black car, and because of the resistance when returning to the road, creates even a more dangerous maneuver with more chances of accidents. So our road ministry wanted uh, a solution. Um, and here you can see the, the current situation. Uh, we have three situations. They will show later in a, in a drawing also. But uh, in the Netherlands, we also have some kind of gutter, uh, often made of, of asphalt. Um, and then we get the, the two layer porous asphalt with a step and that creates the, the resistance when steering back to the road when you hit the side. As mentioned, the three most uh, seen types of road edges on our highways and for all kind of uh, uh, road edge we had to find a solution. That was done in this, uh, uh, in this uh, solution by uh, creating a roadside with porous uh, concrete, previous concrete, um, as one of the four solutions, we could uh, 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 make the application in test track. It was done in the A58 uh, near uh, Etteleur. Um, this was when it was applied. As you can see, it's done by a slip form paper in the right down corner. Um, and it was over a length of, uh, I thought it was over 200 meters. Um, afterwards, there was a test car deliberately leaving the road and coming back and measuring several uh, uh, parameters like the, the lateral acceleration of, of the car, the maximum uh, uh, torque that has to be applied to the steering wheel, uh, and also, uh, uh, not measured, but uh, uh, noted by the drivers, the feel of how safe do I feel to return to the, to the road again. Um, this was also last week. I had a, a little tour to take some pictures. Um, and the concrete solution passed all tests. And right now, it's one of the solutions that is uh, approved uh, by the Dutch Highway Association and can be placed on every part when they want. So it's a kind of the same as the solution we saw before, but just uh, a bit different and also a solution that uh, enhances the safety of the, of the road. Um, another thing I saw in the other presentations also, sport fields. Um, especially uh, water field, field hockey, uh, often played in the Netherlands, and more and more hockey clubs are uh, changing their sand-based uh, fields to water-based fields. Um, and there's always a difficulty with that because the, the, the hockey clubs want it uh, within the summer period when there are no games. Um, at this time, it was about four years ago, I think, um, there were many clubs and there were only uh, a, a few um, certified appli uh, appliers of the top uh, layer. So um, there was a problem. They couldn't open the field in time to uh, adjust for the competition. So we uh, were asked as an uh, innovation center, well, can we do something with concrete? And we immediately thought about the perfuse concrete because that's about the same as the base layer they make for these uh, sports fields. Um, but as always with innovation, um, 
there's a, a, some kind of a, a wrong way to do, but you see that afterwards. Um, I think most of people right now think, well, that's a strange way to, uh, <laughs> to apply concrete. Uh, but this is the way they normally apply the subbase for a sport field. So it's done by little dumper trucks um, and laser guided uh, graders. And normally it works quite well. We just found out that in the period we had to uh, apply this, it was about 30 degrees with lots of wind um, and with the open structure of the concrete, uh, uh, we couldn't cover it enough. And so there was not enough uh, compaction uh, and not enough adhesion between the, the, the stones. So we did that um, with no, uh, <laughs> with, with not, not the right uh, uh, ending. So we thought of another solution um, and that might be something when you talk about the application of perfused concrete. Uh, we did it by uh, uh, not even a modified um, asphalt paver. Um, here we did it uh, 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 by the inclination of the machine, but uh, after these tests, they invested and they now have a laser, completely laser guided uh, system. Um, and as you can see, there's uh, a lot of difference in the way uh, you can uh, construct uh, a sport field like this. The sport federation uh, uh, said they didn't, if they had never seen such a smooth and even subbase for a sport field. So at the end we had some kind of a right way, uh, we found a right way. Um, after the, the concrete, it's, it's measured, it's the measurements are taken, it has to be, uh, uh, it, the, the water has to leave uh, quick enough, uh, it has to be even enough, and when that's done, there's a, a small uh, layer of rubber put over it, and at the end, it's the top layer. Um, so, after this uh, trial, um, this is at this moment, uh, a common way of placing a sport field in the Netherlands, uh, in a sports water hockey field in the Netherlands. Um, and then we have some passive safety solution. Um, maybe you will recognize this, uh, a, fill, a filling point for, um, yeah, this is bitumen, but they also have uh, 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 flammable liquids, uh, stuff like that. It's always uh, uh, dangerous and they have to have some active fire uh, uh, safety regulations. And that's very expensive. Even when um, they aren't filled, the, the, the pipes, you have to maintain them every year, you have to test them every year. So um, they were looking for a, a way to make it a passive safety system. And we immediately thought about uh, the perfused concrete. Um, and we came up with something like this, um, a normal sub-base layer, um, and on top of that we made a constructive uh, concrete uh, a slab with some uprights at the ends, at the edges, and in, uh, in uh, between the, uh, the uprights, uh, upri upright edges we put some uh, perfused concrete um, and we made a drainage system from polypropylene. Um, when we look at the top, we see uh, this. So it's it's more or less a parking uh, for a t uh, truck tanker truck. Um, we have the draining system, and with the draining system, we have an, an uh, water and fluid, uh, flammable fluid uh, separator. Um, well, they, they did some tests with it. We, uh, we made an, uh, 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 some kind of prefab uh, model, uh, about one by one meter. Um, in the top left, you see uh, a barrel with N-heptane, a very flammable liquid that is used by testing uh, on certification. Um, and in the middle, you see a small fire put by the tube that's hanging over. So um, from the barrel, 
the N-heptane, the flammable liquid, is put onto the surface. It drains, it runs to the construction a part of the concrete, and it enters um, where we normally would have the, the drainage system, as you can see in the uh, in the under of, uh, in the bottom of the of the photograph. And this is uh, how it looks. The N-heptane um, is placed, uh, a fire is put on it, and what you see is that it won't burn because the, fl uh, the flammable liquid is at the bottom. There's not enough oxygen. And you see on the right side, the liquid in the uh, lower barrel, mm -hmm. uh, it's flowing in. So it's leaving the, the test slab. And by leaving the liquid, it creates some kind of suction. So whenever there would be uh, a flame, it's, it's, um, it's put out by the air. The flames you see uh, are just uh, the wooden edges <laughs> that uh, that they used uh, that took some some flames. Um, here also we have uh, two kind of films. This is the right one. Later they put another test and there went something wrong, um, and they put the inflow of n-heptane was not uh, restricted anymore, so it put more in than it could take out and probably the whole setup burned almost down. There was, was about half a million of damage. But the, the test lab, um, the, the system worked great um, and it's, uh, it's tested and approved. So when it's tested and approved, there's always someone that wants to try something. Uh, we found uh, a company. Uh, we weren't allowed to take photographs on site from the company, so it's it's a bit hidden. Um, here also we used the asphalt paver, um, very good cleaned as you can see. So um, this was the the, the situation uh, applied by asphalt paver, as uh, as mentioned, compacted by a simple rolling compactor and. We had even uh, some kind of, of exterior um, drainage that we couldn't move. So we have to take this uh, into the construction also. And uh, till this day, there is uh, still no problem with it. And they don't need uh, an, an active safety system uh, anymore. Well, these are some examples of the the, uh, the way we use pervious concrete in the Netherlands as a special application. Um, on the other hand, when you look at the, the previous presentations and maybe the, the coming presentations also, uh, how special is special? It's uh, over when you look over time, people are almost looking for the same. Uh, and I hope by sharing this, that um, maybe uh, it is something that you, uh, in the direction you are looking at, and maybe you think, well, we can use some of that. In that case, please contact me. We can always help. We can always interchange some knowledge and uh, make the use of pervious concrete uh, a, bit, a bit bigger and take it out of a niche market. Thank you. Thank you, Jeroen, for this nice story from road safety on the port fields to industrial safety. Yeah, really nice to see how well it was all experimentally tested in the Netherlands. Yeah, great. Uh, we had one question left, which was a question uh, for Mr. Elia Bonum. And the question is, in general, pavements are designed so that water is prevented from penetration to the bottom layers of pavements, so the subgrade and the sub-base, because it can damage them. Basically, pervious concrete as a pavement layer will help water get to get into those bottom layers. So the question is, what techniques are there to use 
can be used to design pavements with pervious concrete to resist water damaging bottom layers. What arguments could we use to assure designers and investors to design and to accept pavements with pervious concrete when they argue that bottom layers will be damaged by water? It's an important question. It's, let's say, the, the mind switch from a road structure where indeed we want to prevent water from entering into that structure where now we really allow it. But I think that Elia can give a good uh, Yeah, that's that. a really good uh, question indeed. Uh, we're used as road engineers to keep water out of the road structure. Now we let water actually on purpose inside the road structure. So that means uh, we also ad have to adapt the entire road structure, not only the top layer, but the entire road structure needs to be water permeable so we can uh, drain water as fast as possible to uh, the uh, soil beneath. So depending also uh, on the uh, permeability of the soil, we can infiltrate water directly to the soil or we can uh, keep the water during a certain time in your road structure. So um, basically in Belgium, we have also specifications uh, for uh, the materials we use uh, in the base or even the sub-base layers. So if the soil uh, permeability is too low, we also apply a sub-base layer and we uh, only allow that the water uh, will be kept in this sub-base layer uh, to have less risk uh, on loss of bearing capacity uh, in your total road structure. So there are specifications uh, to have the whole structure permeable enough, uh, but uh, there can still be effects on the bearing capacity uh, of your uh, sub-base when the sub-base is filled with water. And uh, actually, we did some uh, some testing uh, also in Belgium um, in on the parking lot I showed in one of the pictures. Uh, it's a parking lot with water permeable pavings, but beneath there's a whole structure uh, with uh, unbound uh, aggregates that can uh, accommodate this water. And we actually did uh, tests. Uh, we filled this structure entirely with water and then tested the bearing capacity with a falling weight uh, deflectometer to see the effect on bearing capacity. And indeed, uh, we see a certain loss in bearing capacity when the structure is filled with water, but it's limited. And so we can uh, still apply these kinds of uh, water permeable structures up to certain traffic loading. So in Belgium, uh, we have a certain traffic loading uh, division of several uh, building classes, and we al only allow these kinds of pavements uh, to be applied up to a certain traffic loading class. So that's how we can answer this question, uh, I think. Uh, I think also other countries like France, uh, the US, they have these kinds of uh, design standards for water permeable pavements uh, as a function of uh, soil uh, capacity and uh, traffic loading. Mm -hmm. no. Thank you. Yes, and as we could see in the different presentations, let's say the majority, or let's say almost all of those applications of porous draining concrete are intended for the pedestrian areas and the low volume traffic uh, areas, so not for heavily trafficked pavements. Mm -hmm. But maybe after the coffee break, we can see uh, other uh, options, other possibilities. I would say, I would yeah. say yeah, yeah, this question proves exactly my point. We need to start to think differently because, yeah, the, the, the person who asked this question is right. This is what we've learned 30 mm -hmm. years ago because that was the, the, the level of technology and technique at the time. But now we need to think something different out of the box and, okay, we need to find solution for the, for the base layers and sub-base layers. Yeah. I have one more question maybe for you, Ichin. It's, it's, it's a... On this topic, maybe yeah, you can yeah, first say that. My presentation was a nice question, and the answer <laughs> was before my question as well. So, of course, we have to differentiate between a, a full filtration system and a system where the, just the, the, the very cold is permeable and you have a um, yeah, impervious um, system. So, you talked about the German regulation, the um, MVP, the, the regulation for permeable pavement, mm -hmm. and this regulation. Um, has a very straight and very tight uh, flow chart where you can check if you are allowed to infiltrate some water into the or to the groundwater. And I guess this is a problem. Of course, we will find some solutions how to make the uh, the, the, the sub layer to make it safe with water if uh, uh, during several um, uh, infiltrations um, and to make it different and to make the full system different. We have to change the regulation. 
because if there are no regulations, particularly in Germany, I don't know about the regulations in, in Netherlands or in, in Belgium, we have to change the regulations and to make it, uh, to, to give the full um, permit of the system a chance. Otherwise, we have no chance. Mm. So if I can make a summary of your question for the people at home, uh, you say that there are certain regulations that uh, do not allow that we infiltrate yeah. water Absolutely. into the soil at some places uh, because of protection of groundwater uh, where we make yeah, drinking water. Yeah, will be a mountain. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in Germany it's allowed with a, it's a K0.3, so 300,000 uh, of, of cars. And, uh, yeah, you mm -hmm. can use it for a, for a very um, small road. So in Belgium, it's the same case. Uh, we uh, can only apply it up to low volume roads because there is indeed a risk uh, for the bearing capacity that can go down if you have your sub base layer filled with water for a certain amount of, of time. But maybe improved testing and more experience can allow to extend the range of application also to higher traffic loading, maybe with alternative solutions uh, in, in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I had a question from Wim van Keulen. He's an expert in, in uh, traffic noise and indeed he asked, can you tell something about the acoustic absorption of pervious concrete which could reduce traffic noise durably? Well, it's not the topic of today. I don't know, Eugene, if you have specifications on that on your thin layer on, on on hydromedia we don't have this uh, we perform some tests on the other material that i presented uh, because hydromedia is not a material to be used on uh, i'll say normal roads yeah. highways uh, high speed roads uh, where the the noise is a problem uh, for concerning the innovative coating we have uh, performed tests in the lab only for the noise absorption. The results are very, very good, very promising. And once we'll be able to perform a real section with this type of materials, we'll make the, the measurements inside, we'll get more information on, on, on this. But to address exactly directly the, 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 the question mm -hmm. of for pervious concrete, it's obviously is not supposed to be used mm -hmm. in in uh, in section of roads where noise is a problem. No. no, that's correct. We also have, of course, the results from 1996, but I think that Wim will already uh, has those uh, available. So I don't think we can give any further information for the moment to that question. And then there was a question for Jeroen. What was the benefit of using pervious concrete at the side of the roads as opposed to an impermeable surface apart from providing water to the grass? And what was the sub-base system that you used? And also, does the top rubber layer in the sports field case reduce the drainage capacity of the pervious concrete? Um, well, uh, to the first question, um, it was just as... Uh, uh, put the, the 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 benefit is that uh, uh, the optical uh, widening does not happen um, there and uh, with growing grass over top of it there is no standing water uh, on the side of the road so it uh, it takes uh, it drains to the ground um, I think that was what was asked be sure uh, what was the sub base system oh the sub base system yeah. sorry um then we had the same sub base system as was that was put on the um, uh, underneath the the, the uh, concrete road there uh, we also have put it uh, underneath uh, of uh, uh, close to the the asphalt uh, roads and then we use crushed uh, aggregates as a sub base layer uh, mostly 20 to 15, uh, 15 to 20 centimeters yeah, yeah, well, normal. Yeah, normal thickness of crushed aggregates. Yeah, and then what about the rubber layer on the sports field? Um, Just... I'm no expert <laughs> expert on the, the the thin layer of rubber, but um, it's a certified system. Uh, that's why we had uh, a certification going on uh, on the permeable concrete, uh, and, and it was monitored very uh, closely. Um, and it interacts, and it interacts. Uh, uh, quite well, the exact amount of permeability and the speed of uh, uh, draining of water is not something I know right now. No. 
All right, thank you. Maybe to come back to the question of uh, Marcus, I believe, about Lucas. Uh, extending the range to higher uh, load uh, applications. Actually, in Belgium, tests are running uh, with uh, asphalt pavements, so with higher traffic loading, that we drain off the water to gutters connected to porous gutter systems that drain the water to the sub-base layer. And then we can actually go uh, to higher traffic loading, uh, also using drainage in the sub-base layer. And these experiments are ongoing now in Belgium with Aquafin, for instance, who is testing these kinds of uh, alternative uh, systems in Belgium. Yeah. I have the feeling that this discussion will go on later on. <laughs> well, or now first going to our coffee break just for the people here in Hotel Châtelet in Brussels. Also, the people at home can take a coffee. Uh, we will start, let's say, at 15 hours 50. Uh, at European time, so five minutes later than on the program. So see you in something like uh, 20, 25 minutes. Thank you. Okay. So, dear all, welcome again for the second part of our workshop on pervious concrete pavements. We already heard uh, three presentations, mainly on the porous concrete solutions. Now we have uh, two uh, other type of pavements. And the first one is a permeable grass concrete pavement. New opportunities with biodegradable formwork, which will be presented by Mr. Fabrice Bonin, who is technical manager uh, of the company Viasol. He will present uh, the company, the French company Viasol for us. It's a, a very nice application, which I have personally discovered uh, some time ago, and of which I thought that it was worth to be presented during this uh, workshop. So Fabrice, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luc. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, today we, we saw three presentations uh, presenting the, the solutions afforded with a pervious concrete. Uh, we have the same philosophy uh, in order to, to ensure and to limit the runoff of water uh, and to ensure the direct infiltration. But we have a different approach. This different approach uh, is uh, to use plain concrete with uh, holes in it in order to, uh, to fulfill this possibility to, to drain the water. Uh, this is Marie. Uh, rapidly, I will present the company, myself. The product, which is Via Verde, is brand. The concept, its characteristics, the fields of application targeted, the technical advantages of this solution, an eco-friendly concept for us, it could afford some good uh, interest for environment, uh, environmental issues, pardon. Um, this product uh, benefits from the support of partners, expert networks and the press releases. And we will show you uh, some, uh, some examples. And uh, we will finish with uh, uh, an overview of uh, realizations in France, uh, where the product is, uh, is uh, sold and examples of amenities and facilities. First of all, the company. The company is called Viasol, which is a brand new uh, company, which is only 10 years old. Uh, she's located uh, in uh, livron sur drome which is uh, in the south of France, uh, close to the A7 motorway uh, between uh, Valence and uh, Montélimar, for people who, uh, who are on this road uh, during summer vacations. Uh, we are 10 employees, uh, and our activity is uh, the supply of special specialty products for exterior decorative concrete. This is uh, the, the product on which we are focused. 
Um, the, the product lines are via Verde, via Print, via Protect, and via Stone. Via Print is a colored surface hardener for decorative purpose, for example, imprinted concrete. Via Protect is a range of solutions uh, to protect uh, the, the concrete, uh, I mean, sealants and so on. Via Stone is a surface retarder to uh, obtain exposed aggregate concrete. And the main product, uh, which uh, is the reason why I am here, is Via Verde, uh, which is a solution for uh, ensure uh, pervious uh, grass concrete. My name is Fabrice Bonin. I'm a technical manager of Via Sol. So Via Verde for us uh, is uh, the union of mineral and grass. This is a paving monolithic system with biodegradable formworks, uh, which is surrounded by cast-in-place concrete uh, to form pervious alveolar slabs filled with grass or gravels. Uh, we often present it with uh, grass uh, cover because it's very interesting and uh, it affords aesthetics, uh, let's say, purpose. Uh, we aim at, say that the four uh, main uh, ideas would drive the process. Uh, the process, the product is monolithic. Uh, this way, we avoid any uh, detrimental uh, uh, effect due to rotting or, uh, or uh, movement once loaded, because uh, uh, we, we, we cover a wide range of applications we will show you after. Uh, the product is alveolar. Uh, it allows a grass uh, plain concrete uh, pattern and it ensures the, the, drainage, the drainage and the, the the flow of uh, water in it. The product is uh, pervious. Uh, it is ensured by the alveolar opening, uh, and uh, so that we, we have the same benefit. And we also uh, want to, 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 to say the product for us uh, afford uh, a, good, uh, a good solution and environmental issues uh, due to the fact that we use uh, some waste to form, uh, let's say, the formwork uh, which allows the uh, the, the, the final form of the, of the product. The characteristics of uh, the, the core product, uh, which is uh, the, the former. Uh, the former is, uh, is a 60 by 80 uh, centimeters rectangular uh, system, uh, available in 2, 8, uh, 12 or 15 centimeters, which is uh, the total height of uh, the total thickness of the slab. Uh, formers can be assembled, lined up, and cut easily because it's it's paper. In fact, uh, the product, uh, the the material is a molded pulp, uh, which is obtained by uh, the mixing of water and uh, paper waste, uh, and uh, which is uh, uh, dried uh, by uh, by a process, uh, industrial process. Uh, the paper, the cardboard, are collected. Uh, in a very close from the processing plant at under less than 150 kilometers from the processing plant. Uh, another interest of the product, there is no production waste due to the fact that uh, if there is altered molded, altered mold uh, formworks uh, during the process, uh, the product are put in the mixer and so that we obtain a new, uh, a new pulp uh, to form a new, uh, new formers. The product is fully biodegradable, uh, which is very interesting uh, for, uh, for the, the, the issues we can imagine, and will decay uh, within months in the soil at the contact with uh, the, the bacteria of, uh, of, uh, of the soil. Another interesting point uh, for the people who, uh, who place the, the product uh, is the fact that uh, after hardening of the concrete, uh, the, lead, uh, the lead of the cell atop uh, is uh, easily uh, destroyed by uh, high water pressure, or uh, can be also easily uh, uh, destroyed by a cutting uh, tool uh, system. But uh, one part important of, of the patent uh, is the fact that uh, we can use uh, water pressure to, uh, to destroy uh, the, the, the top and uh, to, uh, to obtain the opening. The fields of application targeted, uh, mainly parking lots. Uh, which ensure to have uh, some uh, permeable uh, parking lots, uh, dry, uh, tramway platforms, uh, sorry, uh, emergencies uh, path, 
uh, also uh, launch area for boats, uh, bike paths, uh, driveway entrances, uh, all, let's say, uh, equipment where we have uh, some uh, passage of vehicles, but not road. This is not designed to, to ensure uh, the passage of heavy, heavy load traffic. Uh, it's uh, mainly for cars, motor homes for parkings, uh, but it's not dedicated to make some big roads and uh, some uh, uh, important traffic. Technical advantages of the system. Uh, we, we use some plain concrete, so we benefit from the strengths of uh, uh, high, uh, high quality and high density uh, concrete, uh, cast in place concrete reinforced with uh, uh, mesh fabrics. Uh, we have uh, this way no rutting uh, and no raveling, no movement uh, once loaded. Uh, another important point is uh, the size of the cells, uh, which is uh, uh, depending on the height, 2.6 to 3.6 uh, liters. Uh, which is uh, very important to ensure the, the, the development of the, of the root system and uh, to, to allow the cover to, to develop uh, easily and in good conditions. Uh, another point which is for us of interest is uh, uh, the, the ratio, the void uh, plane pattern and ratio, uh, which is of interest because uh, it uh, limits the contact of the tires uh, with the, the cover and with a specific part of the cover, which is the collar, uh, which is the link between the roots and the blades, uh, and which is very important to, uh, to, 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 to keep uh, from any contact with the tires uh, in order to avoid uh, the deterioration of the grass. Uh, and also because it allows a big uh, infiltration rate, uh, which is uh, 240 liters per square meter per minute uh, when the filling is gravels and uh, 90 liters per square meter per minute, uh, once filled with a uh, soil mixture and, uh, and covered uh, with, uh, with vegetation. vegetation sorry. Um, so this is for us very important technical advantages uh, afforded by STEM. Other technical advantages are much more linked to applications. Uh, uh, here on the, on the picture, uh, on the slides, uh, you could see uh, uh, the parking lot configuration. Uh, we have a specific layout with uh, plain concrete uh, uh, and at the middle, uh, the place which is totally covered with, uh, with grass. This way the cars can easily park uh, atop the, the vegetation and so that the people could go uh, and could walk through the plain concrete, uh, which is interesting uh, to avoid uh, uh, let's say detrimental aspect or to, to allow people with uh, in chairs to, uh, to have plain concrete. Uh, this way also we could uh, limit the use of paintings, uh, which is interesting in order to, to limit the, the price of the construction and uh, of uh, the, the, the equipment. For tramway platforms, uh, this is not the main activity uh, which is targeted with, with the system, but uh, it was the, the first, uh, let's say, uh, demand when we developed the product. It was to ensure uh, to have uh, some uh, tramway platforms which could be used by emergency uh, vehicles uh, like firemen or gas or other, uh, other people and to uh, limit uh, the fact that bicycles, joggers uh, could go on the platform uh, if it was in plain material. So uh, this way we, uh, we developed this product to uh, to answer this, uh, this question. Um, and uh, what is also very interesting uh, with this product is uh, the maintenance and the moving is very easy uh, and more easily than it was a pure uh, plain uh, loan. Uh, um, for us, the product has main advantages and also uh, answer to environmental issues. Uh, one of the aspects is the thermal, uh, thermal effect uh, ensured by uh, plain uh, materials uh, we could find in, the, in cities, uh, such as asphalt, concrete. Uh, by this way and using uh, Via Verde, 
uh, we could limit uh, the, the temperature of, of the surface uh, by a, a big amount uh, the picture which is presented uh, we have a temperature surface of 34 degrees uh, atop the grass and uh, for the asphalt uh, we are we are close to 55 degrees uh, of course eva evapotranspiration is uh, the physical principle that helps uh, to uh, limit the, the elevation of temperature uh, the product is pervious uh, we uh, we talk uh, to together of the the ability to to uh, to ensure the the, the drainage uh, and the important point uh, concerns the the formulation uh, the product is made with concrete of course uh, concrete is local this way uh, we are using the standard formulation of the local ready mix plant so let's say 15 kilometers maximum from uh, the site it's a job site and we can also use of course uh, uh, new uh, let's say opportunities afforded by your uh, recycled uh, gravels or low cement uh, low carbon cement so uh, the product uh, is fully in adequation with uh, with a such uh, interest another point uh, which is important for us is the recyclability uh, due to the fact that the mold uh, decays uh, in soil uh, we can ensure at the end of service of uh, the, the amenity of the equipment the parking lot the possibility to easily uh, destroy it and to set apart uh, let's say uh, the concrete uh, the metal of uh, reinforcement uh, uh, without having um, any adverse product like plastic for example if uh, we have chosen to to use plastic for uh, for the for the farmers the partners the expert networks for us is very interesting uh, uh, these products, the products where we say that uh, water will uh, infiltrate uh, are, let's say, uh, difficult to sell because uh, there is a, a lot of question for, for people uh, uh, who consider that it is not a solution, it is not an issue, uh, it could uh, lead to, to problems. Uh, of course, we know that there is a good applications of the product, uh, we won't uh, do uh, some adverse, uh, let's say, uh, uh, utilization of the product. Uh, but it is very important for us uh, to, to find some uh, organizations and people uh, who are able to, uh, to, to see what is important and to help us to develop uh, and to, uh, to make the product to be known. Uh, this way, we have some uh, construction uh, uh, and sustainable amenities uh, partners, uh, which, is, uh, which are, sorry, Bâtiment Durable de, de Méditerranée et Bâtiment Durable d'Occitanie. Uh, on this part of France, uh, close to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, we have some important heavy rains uh, on, uh, on fall and autumn. Uh, and uh, this kind of solutions uh, could be a part uh, to, to solve the problem. Uh, we have also some contacts with les agences de l'eau, uh, which are uh, very important to help uh the cities or uh, the local uh, uh representative to 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 obtain some aids uh in order to uh to 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 find new solutions and uh, to to pave to have a new uh, new equipment new amenities uh another point important for us is to help to uh to to develop new gu new guidelines for for such a product uh, uh, and to help uh, the local uh, specifiers, the architects, to know there is a new solution and uh, which is not, uh, let's say, uh, in opposition uh, with the others, like pervious concrete, but uh, solutions we can be used uh, in, the same, uh, in the same way and maybe uh, one for uh, such an activity and the one for uh, another one. In few few numbers, uh, just to say, the first job site uh, with Viaverde was done in uh, uh, 2011, uh, and now uh, at this date, at this date, yeah, more than uh, 100 uh, realizations have been done yet. Uh, between 2017 and 2021, uh, we sell 86 square meter of Viaverde, uh, which represents the equivalent to 6,000 parking places a few examples of equipment amenities 
Uh, you see, uh, you have a, a parking lot for a, for a company. Another one uh, in Marseille. Uh, this one, uh, we have a small difference. Uh, they decided to put gravels uh, on it in order to ensure uh, an important amount of infiltration. Here, uh, an example in the platform for, for the tramway in, uh, in a Lyon. Another one, parking lot for uh, motor homes in Epernay. Uh, Epernay is the capital of Champagne. And here, a small movie, uh, the overview, just to see uh, how we, uh, how the product is, uh, is set. Uh, you have geotextile. Uh, we put the molds, uh, we put uh, the wire fabrics. Here we have perforated uh, uh, metal sheet in order to, to protect uh, during the, the pouring. Uh, often we, we pour the concrete with, uh, with a pump. Here the contractor uh, is troubling uh, the product. And after he will uh, use a dedicated product just to smooth the surface. Uh, on one day of uh, of activity, they could uh, they could make uh, let's say one uh, eleven eleven places. The applications of surface retarder in order to expose the aggregate. And here uh, you have the washing uh, with the high water high washer high pressure washer. Sorry. <laughs> And this way, it will open the cell. And uh, this way, we could, after, uh, fill the, the, the voids with a, with a soil mixture, uh, which is a, a mix of sand, of uh, coarser elements, of uh, topsoil, and organic amendment, which is not very different from, uh, let's say, a classic uh, a soil for, uh, for loan. And for me, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabrice. I don't know if there are any questions. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we cannot, uh, let's say, go uh, if there is no local, uh, let's say, acceptance or local uh, agreement to, uh, to infiltrate the water. Uh, we cannot uh, go through, uh, let's say, the local decision. In France, we have uh, many, uh, let's say, uh, uh, deci uh, deciders in order to say if we could or not uh, infiltrate. It's a question regarding uh, the nature of soil. Uh, the, the presence of water, let's say, at two meters below the top surface, uh, the presence of a river uh, close to the, the job site, and also if you are in the Natura 2000 area. So uh, if all, uh, let's say, uh, is okay, uh, it's only a question of geotechnical uh, issues uh, in order to see if uh, we could infiltrate in the soil or if not, for example, if we have some, uh, let's say, um, clays, uh, we have to, to find another solution. This solution is to put uh, geotext, uh, geothetics uh, and to, to, uh, to uh, make the water uh, go uh, till uh, a place where it could be evacuate, uh, but we, we could not uh, infiltrate if uh, we have, uh, let's say, uh, minus eight uh, permeability for the soil. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not possible. Question? Did you experiment any cracking between graph or wheel? Uh, cracking in the concrete, yeah. There is a cracking in the concrete uh, between, uh, between the, the, the cells. Uh, which is uh, logical due to the fact that we, we put some reinforcement. 
and the concrete is expected to crack. Uh, it's uh, it's the concrete. Uh, so we we have uh, we have some uh, some crackings, but these crackings are not detrimental for the stability of the system and for the durability of uh, the the equipment. Uh, we made some tests with. Uh, uh, equipment which are now more than 10 years uh, and we did not uh, uh, observe uh, any uh, adverse problems uh, linked to, to cracking. If uh, we had some problems before, it was a question of uh, stability of the soil below. Uh, but regarding uh, the, 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 the cracking, only the, the, the cracking, it's not a problem at all. But, but wouldn't, wouldn't it be better then to provide uh, contraction joints in between the parking places because that would limit let's say the the surface of your your slab because now it, it has the impression with just uh, let's say a light reinforcement enforcement mesh that you can go as, as far as you want the, and then obviously you get the cracks but and if the cracks the crack would happen between let's say the the, the perforated port and the plain concrete then it could be a problem of, of some stability so it would be better to have let's say the crack in the joint where you in, decided in fact we we have uh, we have both uh, we have construction joints uh, which are basically between the first lines of alveoles and the plain concrete because of course mm. the concrete, let's say, uh, so there is uh, a difference. And this is like uh, a cutting joints. Uh, mm -hmm. When you cut the joints on surface, you have uh, below uh, a cracking. It's the same way. Uh, I mean, uh, like the fact that you have no longer plain concrete, uh, you have, uh, let's say, uh, an area where you will have some uh, mm -hmm. cracking. But this cracking is not is mm -hmm. not detrimental mm -hmm. and uh, what we what we do is uh, at the front of uh, of the parking space we made a first uh, join uh, in order to, uh, to 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 help the cracking to to follow uh, mm -hmm. to follow this direction and in the plain concrete uh, sometimes we we ensure uh, joints and we asked the the contractor to make some joints like mm -hmm. let's say uh, uh, regular uh, concrete. Mm -hmm. yeah, it would be interesting, I think, to have some design guidelines on, mm -hmm. on, on that, some recommendations. So, those were the questions for Fabrice Bonnet. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, presentation of the, this uh, nice innovative technique. And let's hope that, yeah, we'll get some examples in other countries as well. Now we are moving to the last presentation of this workshop. And it will be a remote presentation by uh, Mrs. Alalea Kia, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher in structures and materials at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering of the Imperial College in London. Uh, I met uh, Ms. Kia uh, about three years ago in Potsdam and in Berlin for a workshop on innovative sustainable uh, concrete pavements, also for the International Symposium on Concrete Roads. And there I discovered for the first time her, what she called at that moment, a clogging resistant per pervious pavement. So uh, now we are three years further and I have discovered that she made quite some progress in the development of that product. And so I'm curious to hear where we are now today. Thank you very much, Luke. So I start by perhaps sharing my screen. I hope that everyone can see my screen and hear me. Apologies, first of all, for not being there in person today. And I appreciate that um, the last session, so everyone must be tired. So I try and make it as interesting as possible. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. As Luke mentioned, I'm Elaine Akia. I'm a Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellow at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Imperial College London. Um, I'm also the founder of Permia, which is a research-focused spin-out company with the aim of working with the construction industry to deliver our pavement in society and also to raise the profile of permeable pavements. Today, I will be talking about next generation climate change resilient permeable pavements. 
Um, so before starting my talk, I want to first of all uh, start by giving you an overview of uh, my talk today. So I will start with urban flooding and the benefits of permeable pavements, which we all know. Um, and then this will be followed by the challenges with the current generation of permeable pavements. I will then talk about the development of a new type of permeable pavement, which we call Kiacrete, its properties, applications, and our recent White City campus trial site. And I will end my talk by um, going through the future plans in this uh, field and in the research area in general. So I am sure this is uh, based on particularly the presentations today. This is something that all of us are aware of. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we are facing in our society today is urban flooding and the annual global cost of flooding was 60 billion pounds in 2019 and is projected to increase to 500 billion pounds by 2030 with climate change increasing the likelihood of major storm events by 59 percent. This is the reason why it is urgent to develop a climate change resilient permeable infrastructure such as permeable pavements. The permeable concrete pavements offer a solution to urban flooding by reducing stormwater runoff and they are primarily used um, in low load bearing applications like car parks and pedestrian footpaths because they suffer from low strength. As well as absorbing stormwater, they contribute to groundwater recharge, capture pollutants, improve skid resistance and minimize the heat island effect, which are the things that I have observed based on all of the presentations today. The global market for permeable pavements is projected to be worth 18 billion pounds by 2025. Uh, everyone is realizing the problems with the uh, climate change and inc the increasing probability of flooding. And there is an urgent urge to be using uh, products such as permeable pavements. However, unfortunately, permeable pavements are not currently widely used as much as they should be, considering their benefits, and these are due to a number of well-known challenges, which were again discussed widely today. Uh, first of all, they are highly susceptible to clogging, which leads to um, the need for frequent maintenance. They have poor freeze-thaw resistance, which means that it will lead to severe deterioration of the surface, and again, the need for maintenance structurally in particular. And they lack sufficient strength, which means that they can only be used in low load bearing applications. So I will discuss all of these challenges individually based on my observations in the past six years where I've been researching on conventional previous uh, concrete pavements and this work that has led to the development of this new type of pavement. So let's first of all have a look at uh, the susceptibility to clogging. One of the most dominant problems with current generation permeable pavements and their lack of adoption is due to their susceptibility to clogging, which is blockage from debris. So the conventional purpose a concrete pavement as cast is initially unclogged, which is shown on the left hand side. Over time, with rainfall and runoff exposure to sediments, it becomes visibly clogged, as we are showing on the right hand side. This will clearly affect its permeability, and that is shown on the graph um, on the far right hand side where over time, depending on the permeability of the pervious concrete surface, it reduces to zero. And in the case of the most porous sample after seven cycles and least porous sample in, in, in the order of three to four cycles. At that point, these pavements would require regular, expensive, obstructive and time consuming maintenance to restore their initial permeability. However, as we all know in this room, even with this maintenance, the permeability never recovers to its initial value. And um, that over time, over a long term period, over its service life of the pavement, it eventually becomes zero if no maintenance is conducted on the pavement. And this is clearly a flaw that needs to be addressed uh, in order for these type of pavements to be used um, everywhere else um, within our society. The second challenge with the um, current permeable pavements is their lack of freeze thaw durability. So this is how resistant they are to a continual freezing and thawing cycles. So in the lab, we tried to simulate that by exposing the pervious concrete samples to minus 20 degrees Celsius in a freezer for eight hours and then taking them out and putting them in a water bath for four hours. And that would complete one freezing and thawing cycles. And we exposed each sample to 56 freezing and thawing cycles, which according to the standards represents the one full service life of a pavement. And 
because these cycles exert pressure on, on the different permeable pavement samples, as you can see in the graph on the far left hand side, the mass reduces dramatically over the 56 simulated cycles. So for the most porous sample, which had 37% porosity, over half of the material is lost, which is dramatically shown in the before and after picture here. But at cycle zero, we have the sample perfectly fine. And after 56 cycles, it lose, it's losing a lot of mass. And this mass loss is in the order of 10 to 20 percent, depending on the lower porosity scenarios. So this means that if these pavements were used in climates that were susceptible to continuous freeze thaw, then the pavement surface would become severely damaged and that it would need to be replaced and maintained. The final challenge is the lack of strength, which again was widely discussed today. So the compressive strength ranges mainly between 6 to 32 megapascal. And in the case of 32 megapascals, these pavements have very low porosity, 11 to 12 percent. And that means that the permeability will suffer, of course, because they have an inverse relationship. This means that the application of this type of pavements um, is severely limited to low load bearing scenarios such as pedestrian footpaths, cycle paths, and car parks. Therefore, more extreme loading applications cannot benefit from the previously outlined advantages of permeable pavements. To solve these long-standing problems associated with permeable pavements, we have developed Kiacrete um, over the past six years. So our solution has two key innovations. So firstly, we have engineered a new pore structure and secondly, we utilized a higher strength self-compacting cementitious material. And the new pore structure increases the permeability and reduces the likelihood of sediment clogging whilst improving freeze thaw resistance and increasing strength. The change in the cementitious mix also increases the strength and freeze thaw durability. So the next slides uh, will compare the improved performance of our system over the existing conventional pavements. So the, first of all, this video um, shows the conventional system on the left, unclogged with the same porosity as Kiacrete on the right. So both of these samples have the same porosity, both of them are unclogged, and none of them have the sub-base system. So you can see the conventional system, you're pouring a lot of water over the top, and is quickly overwhelmed by the volume of water that is receiving, which means that we have to remove the water source, source from it in order to make sure that the water goes through the pavement in time. Whereas on the right, we have Kiacrete, which is capable of absorbing the same flow indefinitely without having to remove the water source away from the surface of the pavement. The key innovation that leads to this increased drainage is due to the channels that are cast in Kiacrete, as shown on the right hand side. A conventional permeable pavement, as you all know, have, has indirect chan drainage channels, which are shown in the left. So if we get clogging in this section of the pavement, the rest of the pavement, in effect, would not be able to be used and that it would block the water from going further down. However, Kiacrete uses the um, innovation of these direct channels, which means that they are engineered and that the water will go through it indefinitely and avoiding the clogging problem that we have with the conventional systems. So to go over it a bit more scientifically, the graph on the left compares the drainage performance of Kiacrete with conventional pervious concrete pavement. Um, in the UK, for us, the best performing permeable payment product in the current market is uh, the product offered by Tarmac, which has a maximum permeability of one centimeter per second. And the red points um, are a mixture of um, industrial pavements, which are obtained from some of the companies that are actually selling these products, together with the products that we have made in the lab ourselves, which I previously showed in a couple, uh, couple of slides ago. And now this performance is compared with Kiacrete. So you can see that the permeability of Kiacrete for the same porosity is 10 times higher than that measured in the conventional unclogged permeable pavements and is shown in the green points. And more importantly, when it's exposed to multiple clogging cycles, Kiacrete does not clog, unlike the conventional solutions, which do clog over a small number of cycles. And we have exposed these samples to 13 simulated cycles, which is a lot more than what you would expect um, in real life from these sorts of pavements. 
The second challenge was um, the freeze thaw resistance of these pavements. So whilst the conventional system was losing quite a bit of mass, depending on the porosity of the pavement, Kyakrit is highly resistant to degradation caused by freeze thaw. So the graph shows the performance of both systems when they were exposed to exactly the same climate. So the same freeze and thaw cycles of minus 20 degrees Celsius in a freezer to plus 20 degrees Celsius in a water bath. And you can see that Kyakrit's mass remained unaffected. So it can keep the same mass over the 56 um, cycles of freeze thaw. The final challenge is achieving sufficient strength uh, for different applications. This graph shows the strength of conventional permeable pavements and kyakrete of varying porosity. The compressive strength of conventional system ranges from 6 to 32 megapascals. As shown, strength and porosity have an inverse relationship, as we know, and the highest strength conventional permeable pavement has a low porosity corresponding to a very limited permeability, which negates the main advantage of a permeable pavement. So in contrast, Kyakrit's compressive strength is uh, without any sort of reinforcement, just um, the comparison of two unclogged pavements side by side is twice as high as what is found in conventional alternatives. And this is due to the engineered porous structure and utilizing a higher strength cementitious mix around it. So even the lowest porosity sample has a compressive strength greater than 50 megapascals and it has also the opportunity of being reinforced. This means that it opens the door for a range of applications for permeable pavements that can benefit from all of the benefits of permeable pavements that we are all very well aware of. This means that Kyakrete has the pot potential to be used in um, most demanding applications, such as multi-story car parks, highways, critical national infrastructure, such as railways, and even airport infrastructure assets such as taxiways, aprons, and stands. These applications were previously unattainable for conventional systems due to their lack of strength, and this will open the door for a range of different applications for permeable pavements and hopefully raise the awareness of them and open the market to these um, novel um, climate change resilient pavements. We recently delivered Kyakrit at Imperial's White City campus. So Imperial is opening a new campus um, in White City and this campus is known as Innovation Campus. So I was invited to deliver this type of new pavement at the front entrance of the campus to promote innovation and also to test if we use this system just purely for drainage, would it be enough to serve that whole area? So these photographs show the finished Kyakri trial site. So the trial site is exposed to real world loading and weather condition, and we are monitoring its long-term durability and drainage performance. And it has been there since last year, I think July of last year, where it was delivered and it's been there for more than a year with long-term performance monitoring data. So this was taken very recently. So the pavement has already been in place for more than a year. So we're pouring a lot of water over it and you can see the water immediately disappears. So it hasn't suffered from any um, form of clogging so far and is exposed to, of course, is a construction site, so still is exposed to a lot of construction um, sediments and um, it has also been there acting as the sole drainage system for the whole area, which, mean, which means that the contractors and the um, people that are using that area are very happy. Um, so as I mentioned, we are currently doing long-term drainage and durability performance. So the first picture is the White City field site, which is also my background um, on Teams today, which you can see, and it's been subjected to heat waves in the summer, ice and snow in the winter, and it's been performing very well. And we've been conducting long-term drainage and durability performance using drones um, to look at whether there are any sort of cracking that is formed, how is the durability every month by month. So we have a long-term data of its durability performance. And we are also have they have also designed our own infiltrometer that would be useful for that sort of pavement, which is shown here when we are measuring the permeability and how it ranges over time. To continue tackling these research challenges, I recently uh, secured a Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellowship, which means that over the next five years, I will continue to develop next generation permeable infrastructure of sufficient permeability, strength and resilience for more heavy load bearing applications. So as part of this fellowship, I will be working with a range of collaborators and partners um, 
including the National Green Infrastructure Facility at Newcastle University to conduct large scale testing. And I will also be working with a range of industrial partner and engineering consultancies. And of course, we're always open to include more partners as part of this project to work with more people, because I personally believe that research is only successful when you have the industrial partners constantly telling you what are the problems that we are facing within our society and feeding that to your research so that you try answering those questions rather than just answering research questions out of curiosity. So I'm always open to getting new perspectives, uh, criticisms, or even a new vision as to what the future needs to be, what are the questions that need to be answered, particularly from the industry perspective. As part of this fellowship, I will be working with Inverness Airport, which is an airport up north in Scotland, which are exposed to a cold weather. And it is very important for them to uh, be using this pavement, not only from the drainage perspective, but also its potential to mitigate hydroplaning and improve skid resistance, because we are trying to use a technology together with Kiacrete such that it will get rid of ice and snow. And that means that they will not need to be paying any fines or um, use environmentally damaging the ice and chemicals, which is an added benefit of using Kiacrete. Um, so finally, it is uh, just worth mentioning that Kiacrete contributes towards five sustainable development goals and net zero through its reduced emissions. So we are using a lot less concrete because of the drainage uh, pore structure that we have implemented. And we are eliminating regular maintenance, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, conventional systems require regular maintenance because of it uh, to provide clogging resistance. We are using recycled material and we are using low carbon concrete. And uh, we, um, because of its longer service life um, that is predicted, it is more durable um, and it is also contributing to reduced emissions. Kiacrete has the potential, not like any other permeable pavement, to uh, provide groundwater recharge and reduces the urban heat island effect. It mitigates the impact of flooding and also ice and snow buildup. And it increases safety for all of the road users or infrastructure users in particular because it reduces flooding ice and snow build up and also hydroplaning and skidding. So to just summarize what I said today, um, as we all know, climate change is a real problem and it increases the likelihood and severity of extreme weather events. And this is just increasing. And with the recent events in the UK, in Germany, in China, we know that it is urgent for all of us as scientists and industry leaders to do something to tackle the adverse effect of climate change. And permeable pavements are one of the most promising flood mitigation strategies. However, there are a number of well known drawbacks, including clogging, poor freeze floor resistance and low strength that need to be addressed, not necessarily just through the innovation that we have developed, but also through new systems. We developed Kiacrete as one solution to address these challenges, and we recently delivered it at White City Campus, which has shown uh, great performance. Further research will be conducted through my fellowship and through hopefully events like this, where it opens up the floor for um, further collaborations with industrial partners, other academics, other researchers, whereby we can all have the same vision of tackling climate change and we'll work together to come up with new ideas that are out of the box. They are not necessarily just for tick boxing exercise of, yes, I am tackling climate change, but actually contributing internationally to climate change and to improving the way we are all living in our society. And finally, Kiocrete contributes towards the sustainable development goals and net zero. And there are so many um, additional ways of improvement uh, for this product in terms of the way that it can tackle net zero and it can even further improve going into the future because of its additional benefits. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, so please feel free to contact me for more details using the information that is shown on the slides. Uh, I believe as a last speaker, I suppose the benefit is that I can now say I'm happy to answer your questions now. So thank you very much for listening. And yeah, I think that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Halalea. Thank you. Yeah, it was a very nice presentation. Uh, very promising also. I think there is a question, Elise. And I thought it was about, the, oh yeah, what is the porosity of this first project? And did you use a conventional base and sub-base 
on both the first project and the airport project. And that was indeed exactly the same question that I had because uh, we need a permeability of the entire structure uh, in order to allow the water to, to, to infiltrate, to go down. Uh, and especially for an airport project, yeah, you need a, a, a very high bearing capacity. So how did you manage that? Yes, sure. So with regards to the White City Campus trial site, it is exposed to pedestrian traffic and occasional vehicular traffic. So what we are designing is 7% porosity is more than enough for um, the sort of bad ex even extreme weather events that one may encounter uh, for, for that particular application. The benefit of Kiacrete is that it can be tailored to different applications, both in terms of its permeability and in terms of its strength. So the spacing, the diameter of the tubes, everything can be changed. Even the type of concrete that we use around the tubes can be changed. For the airport application, this is something that we haven't delivered yet. So it has been promised to us as part of this funding and as part of the um, application of this pavement because they are seeing a promising future for it. So we are still in discussion with the different designers from the industrial partners as well of what would be the best system to design it for. But as I'm sure everyone in this room will know, the bearing capacity of a pavement is not only dependent on the top layer, but the whole pavement system. So the top layer has a really high strength. And the sub-base system underneath can be twofold. So either we use the conventional sub-base systems, which we use the um, aggregates of different gradations, and we use the storage tank because we potentially want to uh, use the required filtration layers that um, for the airport airport grade filtration layers and reuse that water in the terminal. Um, or we, we are in the process of also designing our own sub-base system. So it, we are always trying to think outside of the box. We don't necessarily have to use the same sub-base system that is used for the conventional systems. You could use a sub-base system that is tailored um, to Kiacrete, which would have a high strength. It would be made of concrete, but it would also provide the drainage that is required for that application. The benefit of airports is also because you have a lot of green space, there you have a lot of space for storage. So that's another additional benefit because we are planning to store all of that water that is absorbed by Kiacrete and reuse that water, which is um, very promising for um, tackling climate change in general and also reusing and recycling water. Thank you. I have another question for this project at White City. Now, uh, how did you put it in place? Was it a uh, in situ cast concrete that you installed and the tubes uh, in advance? They are, let's say, prefabricated and, and you installed them. Did that work well? Um, so the White City campus trial site was in situ. It was cast in situ. Um, and we have the basically the system that creates the channels and then we pour the concrete on, on top of it in situ and then we open the channels at the end. And it's been working really well, so we had no problems with that. But one of the promising um, features that we see for Kiocrit is also providing it as precast slabs because in the permeable pavement market, there are blocks, there are in situ pavements, but there is not precast slabs as such. So we are in the process of fabricating them as precast to slabs, which means that it would provide the quality control that is needed and it would just be transferred to the site and be put side by side, a bit like it, Lego pieces basically, and um, would give us what we require. But for that example, in particular, we used in situ. All right, thank you. I see a new question appearing. So thank you. Could you ex please explain more about your ID compared to concrete pavements in general? Uh, Oh no, I'm so, uh, com yeah, compared to conventional permanent concrete in the case of economic or the tubes used in the casting stage have a reinforcing role? That's a question. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, yes, the tubes do have a reinforcing role, um, but more importantly, they also allow us to put reinforcement on top of them. So with the conventional systems, water has direct contact um, with reinforcement, and there are so many studies that done that leads to, as of course we all know, corrosion of permeable concrete pavements. The benefit of Kiocrete is that it acts like a conventional impermeable pavement as such for the concrete part, so it provides the cover to reinforcement so it can be reinforced, which that's the reason why it has good uh, thermal cracking performance. 
Um, and I think the other question was in terms of cost. So we are at early, very early stages. So this is the first site that we have um, delivered Kia at. So of course, the it's very hard to compare the cost with something that has been used for many, many years. But if you look at the whole life cost of this pavement, it's going to be a lot less than the conventional systems because of the lack of maintenance. Maintenance is something that people usually want to be uh, keeping away from. I mean, by, by talking with all of the highway agencies and even airports, they always say that we want we don't want to do maintenance because it's costly and it's just nuisance. Um, so it doesn't have any maintenance and it doesn't require any specialist contractors to make sure that it's roller compacted or it it reaches the porosity, it doesn't lead to paste drain down, which is the problem that conventional systems has. So any contractor that can pour normal concrete can pour Kia Crete. So overall, the cost will be cheaper. It could be that because now we are at the prototyping stage, if you compare just the direct cost, it may be slightly more expensive, but the whole life cost is certainly a lot cheaper because of lack of maintenance and lack of specialist um, labor contractors. Okay. Fantastic. <clears throat> I wish you a lot of success with the, for the development of your product <laughs> and hope to hear more about it in the future. Great. We also recently. Um, the permeability is the key for me, um, but as higher the permeability of the bearing code is, as higher is uh, the amount of water which has to be handled by the sublayer. Can you adjust the um, uh, the porosity or the permeability of the bearing code? Of, of, of the bearing course? No, of the... Because as high as the permeability is hmm. of the, 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 the permeability of the system is very high, right? So as high as the permeability is, as high as the amount of water which has to be handled by the sublayer. So you have to adjust the permeability of the sublayer as well. Yeah, so... This, uh, maybe there's a gap between uh, mm -hmm. the permeability between yeah. the both systems. Yeah, so, so the question relates again to, let's say, the, the base layer just beneath, because you are able to adjust the permeability of your top concrete layer, uh, depending on uh, the number of uh, tubes and, and on pores that, and, and so on. Right? But the more permeable you make it, of course, the bigger the amount of water that is allowed to infiltrate. And so there you need maybe an adjustment of the base layer. Have you been thinking about that? Uh. Um, well, there are so many, as I think so many of the speakers were trying to answer this question earlier when it came up as well. So there are design guidance in the UK, at least just for the permeability perspective, we call it SUDS manual, which I'm sure everyone must have seen it, that depending on the different soil condition, you use different sub-based systems and you either have type A infiltration where the water go goes all the way to the soil, or you provide impermeable layers and the water goes into a drainage tank. Um, or it partially goes into the soil, it partially goes into the drainage tank. So in the case of Kiakrit, first of all, Kiakrit layer is very shallow. So the one that we used um, at White City Campus here is only 85 millimeters. So it's a very thin layer and the water goes directly through it and it goes into a sub-base layer, which is again, not that thick. I don't have it at the top of my head now, but we didn't go for a really deep section anyway. And then it goes into a drainage tank. So the aggregates underneath have high gradation for the water to go through it very quickly, and then it gets stored into the tank. And then it gets either fed into the current drainage network, or it will just be stored there and it will get pumped out for reuse purposes. So I personally don't believe that the water is going to be in the sub-base for a very long time and it's going to cause any damage because the permeability of Kyokrit is really high. The permeability of the compacted aggregates is also high and then it's quickly going to be stored in a tank which doesn't have any contact with the top layers. And uh, of course, because we have thought a bit outside of the box, although it's a very simple idea, um, it is something that is currently working we are doing the same thing for the sub-base system. So one approach is for people that 
do not want to change the current sub-base system to say, okay, we've proven it, that it worked at the White City campus, it can work on the current sub-base systems. Or if some other projects that want to think more outside of the box and say, okay, we are happy to change the sub-base system, we are in the process of designing completely new sub-base systems that would have really high strength and superior drainage performance, even better than the top layer, so that they can get rid of the water as quickly as possible to recycle it or reuse it or just give it to the drainage system and not being recycled or reused. So there are always technologies. And to be honest, we get happy when we hear problems because that means that we have more opportunity to innovate, more opportunity to research and more opportunity to lead to the further development of this type of pavement. So I don't see that at all as a barrier or as a problem for adoption. All right, thank you. You know, we have a very small but a very interested audience here in our room. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fantastic. <laughs> so I think we have come to the end of the. <laughs> yeah, Claudia. Thank you, Claudia, because she confirms her happiness to be here <laughs> with us uh, and says they had some resistance about concrete pavements in general, so trying to change it. So. She's happy with the information about products, applications, and challenges, because indeed, I think that the pervious concrete pavements are a totally somehow different field of application compared to the conventional concrete pavements. So it may help to introduce uh, the, this type of concrete pavements in a country. It's a, as we already said, it's a wide range of applications. It's an, uh, for different uh, different solutions for different problems and situations, I believe. So, Halalea, thank you again. It's good to see you again. <laughs> thank you very Bye. much. It's very good to see you too. Thank you. So, this is the last chance for any questions here in our room, in meeting room in Brussels or for all of you attending us from home, from your office. If not, I will be happy uh, to say some <coughs> closing words. It was a very fine uh, opportunity to be here with some people together again in the hotel in Brussels to share these experiences. I have the feeling that we've all learned and heard a lot about different types of pervious concrete pavements this afternoon. I think that the discussion has not come to an end, that we will have to keep on sharing the information, the different types of solutions, also the different technical requirements and, and how to overcome the, the problems, how to overcome also the resistance, uh, like is, is mentioned here from, like in Brazil, where we see it in, in other countries. I think here in Belgium, I noticed that we see an increase in the desire to use those uh, porous concrete pavements. For instance, in Brussels, we have a few projects where cycle, bicycle paths uh, will be built in the, the uh, porous uh, concrete. So we see an, an increase in the number of uh, applications. And, and so that's promising. And probably we'll have this evolution in uh, all you know, different uh, all different countries in Europe and all over the world because I can say we had an attendance today <coughs> of about let's say 65 people online and uh, about 14 here in the room coming from different nationalities all over the world from the United States Latin America Australia and South Africa uh, and in Europe, of course. Uh, I thank uh, all of you today, here, live or online, for showing your interest in this UPAVE event in the concrete pavement technology. I thank all the speakers for their tremendous efforts in preparing the presentation, the willingness to share this knowledge and experience with us. I thank all the members and partners of UPAVE for the support to our organization. Uh, for all of you, you can find information how to join as a member or as a partner on our website. A special uh, word of thank, of course, for 
Jeroen, our Dutch colleagues, who was uh, our master of sound and vision today. I think we managed to <laughs> come at the end of this workshop without mm, really big technical issues, well, some minor details, but that was not that important. Also, thank you, Elise, for the daily work, the follow-up, the communication to everyone. So, all of you, thanks a lot and hope seeing you again at a next event of uh, UPAVE. In December, we also organize a uh, event with the European Parliament. There we will talk about resilience of concrete pavements in relation to long-term investment for infrastructure. So keep an eye on our invitations. Uh, subscribe to the newsletter of UPAVE and you will be, keep on being informed of everything. Thank you. Enjoy your day and see you. Bye-bye. Till the next time.